Is is Dave coming? He's he's not coming. He's not coming. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to have Tim Lore, uh, who does not need an introduction for IPHC staff, but uh, for uh, those of you who are on the webinar, uh, Tim is a research scientist at IPHC. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Washington, the School of Aquatic and Fisheries Sciences in 2001. Uh, and prior to that, he had a master's degree from Northeastern University on the East Coast on marine biology. And um, Tim is very well known on regarding his work using um, archival electronic tags to understand um, seasonal and reproductive migrations in Pacific halibut, and that's what he will be talking to us today. All right, so thanks, Tim. Indeed. So thanks to those of you who are inside the building for coming here. Uh, this is a talk that we realized a while ago I've given as university seminars a whole bunch and in short form at a bunch of conferences and sea samplers have gotten to see bits and pieces of it, but I've never actually explained to staff. So that's essentially what what this is, and a couple of you, or one of you, have only been here for two days, so you haven't had an opportunity to hear any of it. So uh, obviously from the title, this is about migration and about scale dependence and about how all that fits into our research program. And if I can figure out how these slides move. How do I make them move? Just a, yeah, I've now frozen yeah, no. that. There we go, I can just use the keyboard. Can I do them? Yeah, okay. So basically what this is gonna be is, this is gonna be a survey of all of our migration research, uh, trying to demonstrate essentially how all of the different pieces that we've been working on in recent years fit together and the continuity among these that, that lends itself into a research program structure with the caveat that this will be heavily biased toward the last 20 years. Um, why the last 20 years when we have an extremely long history of migration research? Beginning in 1925, the Halibut Commission has done a lot of tagging research. Tagging and migration was essentially the first research that we started using strap tags until the 1970s and then from the 60s to the present using a lot of wire tagging. We've deployed on the order of 400,000 tags on fish and I'm not sure exactly how many recoveries we've gotten, but it's on the order of tens to potentially 100,000 fish. 52,000 tag recoveries. Those have given us our, oops, if I'm locked out while he does that, because I'm not moving now. <laughs> there we go. Those have given us essentially our foundational understanding of broad scale stock distribution, dispersal and population function. Uh, they were used, and I'm gonna have to go with the keyboard. I'm totally freezing. There we go. Those gave us our foundational understanding of things like population structure, which lend themselves to uh, our regulatory area structure today, as well as sort of the broader scale structure that we refer to areas one, two, three, and four. And for those of you who uh, are new to the process, you won't see area one anymore, but that was the Pacific Northwest before it was blended into area two. Seasonal migration was recognized as being very important early on and as well as contranatant migration, that is sort of north to south and west to east migration of juveniles to counter or offset larval advection in the pelagic phase. And if you want those details, there are a lot of papers and a lot of reports that you can go back and, and dig into the details of our early research. But the primary intent of this presentation was to essentially give you an idea of what we've been doing recently, how all of those things, as I said before, are integrated and can be further developed. And we won't talk about further development, but for those of you involved in that process, that's something to keep in mind as I go along. There'll be a lot of themes that run through this that link things together. And in general, all of the studies over the last 20 years can be thrown into sort of a management structure and scale dependent processes but I'm gonna start first by sort of defining what I mean specifically about migration and a couple of other terms. Migration in this context is the self-directed or directed movement of individuals from one place to another. So it's not passive, migration is directed, dispersal can be passive. So in a human sense, most of us were born someplace else. We went 
to college, we came here to work, and we may go someplace else to to retire. And that's that's a long term migration. Going back and forth from your childhood home to this place to visit people at Christmas or have them visit you is also a migration. Home to work again is a cyclic migration that we are pretty much all engaged in. And even something as simple as getting off the couch and going to the kitchen for a sandwich is also a migration. So in an ecological term, we're talking about ontogenic migration. And I do mean ontogenic, not ontogenetic. I will simply say that ontogeny follows phylogeny. Ontogeneti does not follow phylogeneti. Seasonal migration, diurnal migration, and then subdiurnal migration. And we also have dispersal and dispersion. As I said, those are very related terms, but those are not necessarily directed. Those can be passive. Dispersal, especially in an ecological modeling framework, is simply the movement of an object or an individual away from a point of reference. So if you think of a larva in current, the pathway that it travels is its dispersal pathway. Dispersion is very similar, but dispersion is necessarily a group attribute. It is either the static distribution of numerous individuals around a point of reference or the movement of those individuals away from a point of reference. So again, with the larval example, this would be dispersion of a larval pool. You have a tight release. It then begins to become a larger pattern and then they, in this case, a large asymmetrical pattern. This is the dispersion. As a noun, it is simply that static. As a verb, it's this change over time. And this is a dispersion kernel or a dispersal kernel. Uh, that will be a theme that will keep coming back and that can be mathematically defined and loaded into models. So you'll hear dispersion kernels a lot in this. For the work we've done, we can group all of the, all of the work into sort of three different categories of scale and temporal scale relative to life history. We have large scale multi-generational studies that look at sort of cumulative ontogenic effects in the population. Mesoscale, which is generally ontogenic and within generations, and fine scale, again, diurnal, subdiurnal, and seasonal type stuff. Um, some examples of how these relate to management, I'll just give one or two of each. At the large scale, how is the stock organized? Does this match our underlying management design vaguely? Specifically, are our regulatory areas in the right place? Do we have our lines in the right place? That is, if we have functional population structure that's broken up into a lot of different regulatory areas, that's fine. The guys in assessment can re-aggregate those data and still describe the population and apply management to it effectively. But if you've got multiple population components in an individual area, things get a little bit more dicey trying to extract what's going on and trying to apply your management strategy to that. Um, Intergenerational, cohort level, a lot of spatial recruitment patterns lead to really important questions, especially according to fishing mortality. And because we're a treaty organization, one of the things we get a lot is, and has got, have got a lot and probably will again, is what does Alaskan bycatch do to Canadian fishery productivity? And at the smaller scale, how does fish behavior interact with, with harvest strategy and or assessment? There are a couple of pretty obvious ones here. One is, does seasonal migration redistribute fish in ways we don't understand? Specifically, we talk about the survey distribution as the stock distribution. Well, it's only the stock distribution in the summer, and the fishery sees that stock over a longer period of time, over nine months, and maybe in the future over 12 months. And there are reasons why it would be good to know how that relates to what our survey distribution is when we, when we look at harvest strategy and so forth. And from a Survey perspective again, how do foraging dynamics affect indices in abundance? In particular, how does survey CPUE relate to actual underlying abundance? It's important to recognize that all baited gear surveys are not indices of abundance directly. They are indices of feeding intensity, which we assume to be proportional to abundance, but there are a lot of ways and reasons in which that proportionality can be nonlinear and can vary from space in space and time. So the studies that follow will occur along a continuum. We love to group things and I love to group things and, and draw lines, but in the real world, there probably aren't that many lines. They are all intentionally integrated or for the most part are intentionally integrated. And again, they lend themselves to long-term planning, but we won't get into that. So the three categories, I'll do large scale, mesoscale and fine scale, probably take me about eight to 10 minutes to do large and fine and about 20 minutes to do to the mesoscale processes. So in large scale processes, again, how is the spawning stock organized structurally and how does that relate to our underlying 
design. When we began this around about 2001, 2002, we were at extremely high population abundance, but we knew that the population was gonna decline. So one of the fundamental questions was, how will the population decline? Will it, as was our general operating framework around 2000, act as a single population that will contract to its center of abundance around Kodiak, that's what we always said, and that will be amenable, quite amenable to coastwide assessment. Or is it a bunch of sort of subpopulations that are linked together that each contract around their centers of abundance and break into sort of regional productivity and regional dynamics that are more amenable to spatially explicit approaches? We've done a lot of pat tagging experiments to look at this. I think most of you now definitely know what a pat tag is, but for some of you who don't, uh, it's our highly expensive and no longer this large tag with a package of depth, temperature, and light sensors that's surgically attached with a titanium dart to the back of the fish. You program it to record the data and pop off on a pre-programmed schedule. It broadcasts the data to the satellites, which also geoposition the fish and give you a pretty accurate location in the best of worlds. And importantly, they also collect light data. So in ideal situations, you can get a lot of positions of the fish at least longitudinally during time at liberty. In essence, for days in which you can draw a light curve, local noon is your longitude. Method developed uh, shortly after the age of discovery to keep English, Portuguese, and Spanish sailors from crashing into North America without recognizing it. Uh, also now very good for wildlife management in the present day. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. That'll be another one of the callbacks. These can be broken down essentially into two different study types of studies. One are our summer to winter studies. We're looking at movement of fish from shallow water feeding grounds out to generally uh, deep water shelf edge spawning areas, which is not to say that some fish don't spend the entire year in deep water, but that's a separate issue. And summer to summer tagging, looking at site fidelity and regional mixing on sort of interannual time scales. Overall, we've deployed a little over 400 tags in these studies starting in 2002 and going up to 2017 with more to come. Almost through the entire range, but I'll show a couple of gaps to this a little bit later. Uh, the winter tagging a little bit less, large, smaller sample sizes than our summer to summer tagging, but have generally shown considerable dispersal in the Gulf of Alaska, fish moving around the Gulf of Alaska a lot to spawn in areas where they're not feeding. A fair amount of movement along the Bering Sea shelf. Now, this is an extremely small sample size, but I'll show some backup data to this in a moment. And relative isolation out in the Aleutians. In particular, in the Aleutian Islands, a tendency for fish to remain within their island groups. So fish out in the near Rat Islands around Attu tend to stay there, and fish in the Andrianos tend to stay there, where fish in the Fox Islands further east tend to be more dispersive. So it suggests sort of four population subcomponents in terms of spawning structure, a group in the Gulf, a group in the Eastern Bering Sea, and potentially two separate groups out in the Aleutians. When we look at our uh, the map, this, this makes a lot of sense just sort of biogeographically. There appear to be sort of three natural barriers to movement. The Alaska Peninsula separating sort of basin scale processes in the Gulf and the Bering Sea, and some deep water Aleutian passes that are deeper than Typical halibut distribution, I'll say, that seem to be preventing fish from moving back and forth. Now, I will point out that when I say barrier, I don't mean wall. We know that fish move across these, and we should expect fish to move across these. If fish didn't move across these, we would have four species, not one population with, with subcomponents. So they're sort of permeable barriers. So when we look at the summer data, summer to summer tagging, uh, heavily biased towards sort of Bering Sea dynamics and this transition between the Bering Sea and the Gulf, it's been most of our work. Higher sample sizes and still sort of the, sort of the same patterns really. Um, a lot of movement, the most highly dispersive fish are, were all the fish that we tagged in 4A South and some of them just north of the islands. Giving us sort of, again, high mixing in the Gulf. A lot of mixing along the Bering Sea shelf edge, including up into the Gulf of Anadir and across into the Russian, Russian side of things, and two isolated group in the Aleutian Islands. Now, I started this by saying that this would be large scale process, and then I showed you tags that are out for six to nine months and tags that are out for a month, which is not exactly multi-generational, but we do have some backup on this 
Uh, one of the things that links to this that you might not think of migration studies initially as our initial population genetics work. Population genetics really is migration. It is the product of migration. And so it's another way of looking at migration over much longer time spans. Decadal is probably optimistic. It's more like 100 year to 1,000 year timescales, depending on, on the mutation rates of the markers you're looking at. So big separation in the timescales of these two studies, but still sort of the same spatial approach anyway. So this work started in 1998 with opportunistic samples, as well as samples that were collected on survey. Uh, we collected a bunch of samples at spawning grounds from Canada up into Pribilof Canyons and the central Aleutian Islands. And then the opportunistic samples were from Russia and because we couldn't pay about enough money to go out to Atu in the winter, those are summer samples. And more or less, we end up with sort of this, the, again, the same sort of pattern looking at microsatellite loci. We did an analysis with 60, 61 microsatellites, a bunch of those anonymous just sort of randomly drifting in time and then express sequence tags, which are at least theoretically attached to coding regions of the DNA and are potentially more, more subject to directional drift. We got shockingly low FST values, in some cases negative FST values, suggesting almost twin relatedness in, throughout most of the range, but still two genetic clusters. In particular, a genetic cluster out in the Western Aleutians at Petrol Bank and Attu Island that is separate from this group that is all highly related. So again, fairly similar conclusions in that we've got Aleutian segregation at sort of fishery relevant annual time scales, probably three spawning groups in the Gulf Bering and Eastern Aleutian Islands with a lot of relatedness and genetics relatedness can be any life history stage. And again, in a little bit, I'll show you a figure that probably explains why we have so much relatedness on the, on the Eastern side of the range. And importantly, these are consistently, or these are consistent with our movement toward, Ian and Alan's movement toward biological regions, trying to get people to think about this stock less as regulatory area specific and as sort of functional groups. Here we've got the Eastern and Western Gulf, and again, the Eastern Bering Sea and Aleutians. Slightly different, but quite parallel really. And a little bit of a question over whether or not, as I said earlier, we have enough regulatory area lines, whether we might want another line out in the Aleutian Islands, whether for management or just for sort of data segregation and being able to understand and characterize that better. And I'll simply say that uh, it's a little premature. Again, these were summer samples and for winter, for uh, genetic studies, you don't really want summer samples. So we will have a call this winter to see whether or not we can get vessels out into the Western Aleutians to collect some samples and reanalyze that. And we do have a little bit of a positive response already from that, I will say. And finally, again, we've got some relatively, not egregious, but potentially important omissions in a broad scale design. Navarin Canyon, which links sort of US waters to Russian waters is undersampled and understudied. And again, I'll show you another figure of, or a couple more figures of why we probably care about Russia. The Eastern Shelf, the CDQ and native communities of the Eastern Shelf are highly underrepresented in this. There are some interesting dynamics probably in inside waters that are different than outside waters, which again, there'll be a call back to that, which will invoke somebody who I believe is on the webinar. Hi, Julie. And the far Southern range edge, there are range edge dynamics that can be really interesting and we haven't done anything really in California waters. This summer, we will start to get some traction on the, the uh, Eastern Bering Sea Shelf up in Area 4E, Norton Sound. Uh, Norton Sound Econo Economic Development Corporation is spearheading an effort to do a whole bunch of tagging up there over the next two years in collaboration with ADF and G and UAF. And uh, we have been asked to partner on that as well. So there will certainly be tags going out up there. So moving on to sort of mesoscale processes, ontogenic migration in particular, uh, our first modern experiment in this category is, is probably the Pitagni experiment. Now this sort of predates the intentional integration of everything, but I think it also does integrate into this extremely well. It was not intended initially as a migration experiment, as many of you will remember. It was solely couched as fishing and natural mortality estimation and abundance estimation as potentially a way to replace our numerical stock assessment with a mark recapture method. In short, they didn't work. 
for reasons that have a lot to do with migration. But the reasons that have a lot to do with migration are why it was so good for looking at migration. It turned out to be an excellent migration study, really. Um, I will caveat this as late ontogenic migration, primarily due to the tag recovery structure. The whole idea was to get tag recoveries in an unbiased manner that the fishermen could not see. So it was all sort of invisible tags injected into the cheek, which were then scanned for commercial retention. So for males, by the time you're legal, you're probably adult, almost truly adult. For females, a lot of those are adult. Uh, the rest of those are probably sort of late juvenile. There were 44,000 tags released in 2003 and another almost 24,000 in 2004, all the way through the survey grid. Again, we, we put samplers in ports to scan the offloads for these tags, got about 75% of the offloads sampled, giving us about 43% of the, of the catch, which is really just, that's a phenomenal amount of fish. It was a pretty spectacular tag program. And Ray was able to then go back and model these as migration probabilities and migration rates according to length and age, as well as to tabulate those as emigration probabilities specifically among regulatory areas. And I promised you a call back to dispersal kernels. These are, in essence, dispersal kernels. They are various forms of dispersal kernels based on probability. And a lot of what you want to do when you're modeling movement of fish in space and time, either through an assessment framework or just through ecological modeling, through metapopulation or landscape ecology modeling, is you need to start the fish and then you need to migrate them according to some sort of dispersal probability. And often one of your fundamental questions is, do you have fish that move in a stepwise fashion, juveniles that stay in their nursery areas and then quickly move out to their adult areas and settle down to a home range? Or do you have sort of a more smudged, smooth effect? And ideally, if you're gonna do these as spatial models, you also not want not just probability, but you want a long short distance. You wanna know how far to make those fish move. Again, that's the mathematical definition of sort of those two dimensional kernels. The pit tag data can be used for these by aggregating data. They're a little bit coarse in that the recovery data are to statistical area scale. So you don't really get pinpointed locations on where the fish are, but you can get a general notion of where they're going. Ideally, we would also like compass direction in these sorts of models. Again, you can get a certain amount of that by statistical area, but you'll get higher resolution if you have individual point-to-point -point data. We'd also like to be able to do these sex-specific. There are a lot of reasons to believe that males and females in a population like this will move and function and disperse much differently due to energetic constraints and, and their general life history. And in the pit tag world, we didn't know sex. Fish are eviscerated at sea, and this was before we had an ability to sex the fish genetically, which we do now. And they're restricted to two-point mark recapture, as I said. That's not necessarily bad. Of course, it's good. The more information you have, the better. What's even better, though, is a lot of information on where the fish are between mark and recapture, so you can do the probabilities and the distances for individual fish as well as populations. And that gets me into hidden Markov modeling, which, Julie is out there. She can now monitor whether or not I explain Markov modeling properly. <laughs> Hidden Markov modeling is, in essence, a statistical life history modeling, at least in this context, a modeling framework in which we can convert environmental data into migration pathways for individuals and into time-indexed time distribution and dispersal patterns for entire populations. For example, from a pat tag, this is one of our most classic pat tagged fish. It was a fish that was marked out in the Eastern Aleutian Islands, south of the Fox Islands, and a year later, it popped up just west of where it would mar was marked. So from two-point data, nominally, this fish didn't really go anywhere. Now, in the hidden Markov modeling context, the hidden state is where was the fish the other 363 days? And the answer to this for this fish is, really simple and really clear. And it comes from those light data. We've got a beautiful trajectory of light-based longitudes on this fish, demonstrating that it stayed around its marking location for about two months. It then traveled across area 3B over the next couple of months, went out to roughly Yakutat to spawn in the middle of winter, 
opportunistically coming up to light depth for about five days in midwinter to show us exactly where it was. Then went back across 3B to get back into 4A by the time the season opened and then popped up pretty close to where we had tagged it. Now, I just eyeballed this because this fish is just so bloody obvious as to exactly where it went. But in a hidden Markov modeling framework, you would use the other environmental data as well as the longitudinal data to give you a much better pinpoint notion of where the fish was or at least where it was likely to be probabilistically. In this case, we've got all of these depth data and especially for the time when it was off on the shelf edge where you've got a relatively constrained depth distribution that the fish would be at, the hidden Markov model would do an excellent job of pinpointing really where this fish went and how fast it went through each of those, those regulatory areas. Again, the, the key is that it does this probabilistically. The model is going to have the opportunity to place the fish in a lot of different locations based on simply something like longitude, which is a little coarse, and depth, for which there are a lot of different areas that have the same depth. Now, tag manufacturers produce canned models that can do this, and they all love to run your data through the canned model, and they generally do not work. They work sort of, but they generally do not work. So this is an example of a fish that we tagged in the Salish Sea, tagged off Port Angeles, came up in the San Juans, and the model tells us that it spent a year jumping magically between these six locations without spending any time in between them, while everything else, including logic, tells us it never left the Salish Sea. So what the heck is the model doing? Well, what it's doing is it's giving us bad locations based on misspecified likelihoods. That is the way the model calculates the likelihood of a fish being in a location. So imagine, for instance, we know we tagged the fish at 600 meters and on a given day somewhere down the road, it's at 200 meters depth. Now we know how fast the fish moved. So we can estimate in this simple situation that if this is our bathymetry, it might have been in any of these three locations based just on movement speed. Now we can be pretty sure it wasn't in cell one because there is no 200 meter habitat. But the question is, is it in cell two? 80% of which is 200 meters depth, or is it in cell three where there's only 2% of the habitat that is 200 meters depth? Now, if I told you that this is a sand lance and cell two is sand and cell three is rocky slope, you could be pretty confident that it's in cell two. If I told you it was a rockfish, you could probably be pretty confident that despite the fact that there's hardly any rocky habitat out here, it's still there. What about a halibut that lives everywhere? It gets a lot more complex and it has a lot to do with what the fish is doing. Suffice it to say that we have a fair amount of circumstantial evidence that suggests that halibut that are migrating like to do so sort of along the shelf edge, probably on sloping bathymetry. And while the fish are in feeding zone, they tend to be up on the shelf in the flats. So the answer for this is probably state dependent. You need to know more about the fish you need to know more about the season. And in general, you need to know all of these things for any fish that you're modeling this way. From global position estimator, it's picking all of the cells probably that just have a lot of the depth. And so these are parsimonious solutions. It jumps it around between the five depths that satisfy all of the depth data in the tag. And it doesn't necessarily have a bearing on the real behavior of the fish because this model is designed primarily to locate tuna and sharks and salmon and halibut and lingcod and seals and penguins and grizzly bears. And so its performance varies highly depending on the species. The bottom line is you have to tune your model to the species of interest. And it takes a tremendous amount of understanding and work and nuance and that's where Julie Nielsen comes in. She has spent a lot of time working with the people who have developed these models in parameterizing these models for benthic species and epibenthic species. Uh, just finished her dissertation and has a lot of really good work out there. And I will also add that she's got a paper coming out soon or at least being uh, worked on on geomagnetic data, which I won't talk a lot about, but it's both highly promising and highly frustrating. And we'll, we'll figure out how to use geomagnetic data someday.
But this also then links highly into other archival data, long-term archival data, not just our PAT tag data, but the emergence of our long-term archival tagging program, which we have started last year with uh, juveniles. And again, one of our major desires is to be able to track juvenile migration downstream. And the more data we can get for longer periods of time for these fish, the better. So these will give us highly resolved light and depth data, and in the future, potentially things like accelerometry and geomagnetism, we don't have that loaded in right now because we don't know how to use it. Unlike the pit tagging program, we finally now have the ability to sex fish. We can do that in advance if we want to target demographics using ultrasound, or we can do it post hoc with genetics and split these out into sex specific migration patterns. And again, with these long term data sets that probably can go out to seven years. We're actually not sure how long these tags can run because Low Tech finished developing them about five years ago and the ones on the shelf, the batteries haven't gone dead yet. So they don't quite know how long they'll work, but they'll work for a very long time in theory. Another one was recovered in the fishery today or yesterday or very recently. So that's 29th, okay, a few days ago. So that's fairly exciting. These things are actually coming back. That can give us things like onset of functional maturity, which I won't talk a lot about effective spawning biomass, but then migration links into things like spawning stock biomass estimates and being able to calibrate the difference between total mature population and each year the fraction of that population that truly actively spawns. And I'll show you a little more data on how that can be verified. And again, all of these represent inputs into hidden Markov models as well as other forms of spatially explicit modeling to understand distribution of the species and how that interacts with management. Uh, again, last year we, we started that. We got about almost 300 tags out. Uh, once again, you will notice a dearth of information on the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf where we don't really have a set line survey. All of our stuff is highly biased toward where we have set line stations, but I will simply say that this summer we should be getting traction on that as well. That's going to be the focus of this year's deployments. We also have coastwide archival tag, uh, wire tagging, which was initiated in 2015 on um, some of the trawl surveys and 2016 into the set line survey and is extending through this year and, and hopefully kind of forever. Uh, 8,600 fish tag to date, I'm sure we'll probably get up to around 10,000 by the end of this year, I would hope, with 74 recovered so far. The release protocols on this are different than the pit tagging experiment. Pit tagging was scaled specifically to abundance to give us the ability to more quantitatively estimate things like migration rate and migration probability. This is a little bit more, I wouldn't say ad hoc, but uh, it's, it's I believe 50% of the vessels tag and, and we release the fish that were otherwise not going to be sampled for otoliths. But it gives us data of a similar nation, uh, especially in terms of pattern distance downstream. And again, it, it might be relevant to defining things like dispersal kernels. Uh, Ray has also done some really nice analyses of juvenile CPUE, especially in the Bristol Bay area and the apparent downstream flow of juveniles. I will leave that for another time, but that's all highly relevant to this. And those things functionally are two-dimensional dispersal kernels. They're, they're quite beautiful. And honorable recognition, the tail pattern project with this becomes my only actual animated slide, which is driving me crazy because I didn't know how to, how to extract it. But work that uh, Claude and Brian Briones, who was our intern in 2017, have initiated and are still working on looking at whether or not we can use the tail pattern as essentially a natural tag. This, in some senses, would be similar to conventional tagging in that you still got to get the fish and you still got to look at it. But especially for juveniles that are very small, this could be something that is never shed. And so you could eliminate all of your tag shedding issues if this does work. And so that would be fairly powerful. So moving down slightly to early ontogenic migration, this is essentially questions about recruitment source and dispersal prior to entering fisheries. Again, a lot of impact to things like bycatch mortality estimation, as well as spatial recruitment dynamics for the fishery. Yeah. Generally not amenable to tagging studies because really what you want are age one individuals and less because the recruitment source is going to be very close to where they settle. And by the time they're age two and three, they start, they start moving off of those and your resolution starts to get coarser. We, have, we would have a lot of spatial biases if we attempted a tagging program because there are so many nurseries, and I'll get into that in a moment, that it's really difficult to know where and how to tag, especially if you're trying to do in order uh, relative to abundance. 
and you'd be likely to have massive mortality and tag shedding if you tried conventional tagging. So what we really need is a natural tag, and ideally a natural tag that exists in all fish so that you don't have to pre-sample them, so that later in life you can tell where they came from. And so that's where otolith elemental research comes in, where otoliths can provide a permanent conserved record of location because they lock, like tree rings, a time series of chemistry into them. And that chemistry is affected by both biotic and abiotic conditions, diet, metabolism, water campus chemistry, and that varies in space and time. And it's been proven in a lot of species to be a really good indicator of both origin and life history. Now, what you will see in most of the literature, if not all of the literature, is the question posed as, do fish from different nurseries have different elemental signatures? And that is not our question. It's important to note that that is not our question. We know that's true. It's intuitive, and also when you look at the initial data, it's clearly true. The issue is, can Pacific halibut from different nurseries have the same signature? For example, how likely am I to look at a fish's chemical signature and say, ah, I know that fish is from British Columbia, when it is actually from the Sea of Okhotsk off of Japan that just happens to look exactly the same and I didn't sample it. Now, to be able to answer that question, we could go out and we could just simply sample every nursery in the world and characterize them all and see if they overlap. But even in the managed range here, that's 7,000 kilometers of coastline, probably thousands to tens of thousands of individual nurseries. And that doesn't even consider the fact that the species goes all the way through the Western Bering Sea, Sea of Okhotsk, Sea of Japan, and we could have fish from there too. So that's impossible. We will never be able to do that. The answer seemed to be spatial trend analysis. Do elemental signatures trend from east to west and north to south in consistent enough of a pattern that we won't be making egregious mistakes? So from 2002 to 2007, we did a pilot study where we took fish from the trawl surveys in the western Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea. And those are primarily age two individuals. And earlier I said we want age ones. So this is also a little bit coarse, but this is what the trawl survey gives us and subjected them to elemental analysis, to stable oxygen and carbon analysis and trace metal analysis, and then ran them through discriminant function analysis to see how easy it is it to back assign those fish to where they came from. The bottom line is if you try to do it by sight, it's a muddled mess and your assignments are fairly terrible. Oddly, that turns out to be good because as you back off to region moving along the Alaska Peninsula and Bering Sea versus Gulf of Alaska, those patterns become much more clear. So in essence, what you're saying is individual sites are not important, region is important, and importantly, or notably, <laughs> the regions where things start to be robust are at a scale that's fairly close to our regulatory area scale and, and the way we want to apply management. So quite promising, but quite small relative to the true range of the species, we know that nurseries go at least all the way down to British Columbia and Dogfish Banks, and they're going to go west into the Bering Sea, again, into the Sea of Okhotsk. And again, you're, you're moments away from a slide that'll demonstrate why Russia is potentially important. And that's larval advection analyses that Lori and Ray, in conjunction with Janet Duffy Anderson and Esther Goldstein at NIMFS have been involved in, numerical and spatial modeling of larval distributions. The initial question being, what are, are the dynamics of flow through Unimac Pass, delivery of larva from the Gulf into the Bering Sea and potentially back again? But I think these have been really enlightening in sort of their broader scale implications. Uh, and I would point out in particular, the indication of not a lot of delivery out to the Western Aleutians that we seem to have as an isolated location based on our pat tagging and genetic analyses. Again, linkages between these, but a lot of distribution within that area, that's probably what's giving us genetic signals that are fairly homogenous, even though the adults remain segregated at fishery scale, and the indication that we probably do have delivery out to Western Russia. And I will simply say there are other bits of evidence that are suggesting to us that our Bering Sea fisheries may be 
more reliant on Russian settlement than we had really been giving credit to. But I don't have time to really go into those. Currently, honorable mention here, because I did say this was a migration study and this is clearly dispersal because these are passively driven and the vertical distributions are based on stage development, which may or may not be passive or directed. But directed movement of larvae has been shown to be very important in a lot of other species. Deal vertical migration can subject fish to completely different current structures and especially reef fishes are able to horizontally navigate back to shore to increase their settlement potential. That can be incorporated into these models and might be someday. It's just not at that stage yet. And we probably also need some experimental data before we get to that. So finally, the fine scale processes, and this will be considerably shorter than mesoscale, will have seasonal migration and sort of diurnal subdiurnal stuff. Our original seasonal migration work was in response to fleet and commissioner requests very shortly after establishing quota fisheries the fleet became concerned that the three-month close season was an excellent avenue for aquaculture to get into the market and depress their fish prices. They had watched the same thing happen with salmon fisheries, even without a closed season, that salmon aquaculture really ramped up while the value of the salmon catch tanked. So they wanted us to open the fishery to longer than 12 months, to longer than nine months. But the question was, will Canadian fish move up into Alaska to be harvested by Alaskans and would we be shifting quota to Alaska preferentially? Again, we're talking about movement of fish from nearshore grounds out to deep banks, but with all of that redistribution within the Gulf of Alaska, the notion was Canadian fish would probably shift up into Alaska. Now this is again, this is regulatory area structure where we're talking about some fish being Canadian and some fish being Alaskan, which biologically is not relevant, but we are a treaty organization, so it's quite relevant to our mission. And early analyses suggested that as much as 60% of the Canadian fish based on tag analysis, conventional tag analysis might then become de facto Alaskan quota. So we use PAT tags to look at the distribution of fish on a number of dates around that sort of spring transition, the, the return and I will simply say that with 70 some odd fish tagged, the sort of eight that you see are the only ones that were out of area. So the migration rates and interception probabilities are probably a lot lower than we had expected. And that sort of alleviated some fears. And then aquaculture came out and said that they could produce halibut at roughly 35 cents a pound more than the wholesale price of Pacific halibut. And they gave up on halibut aquaculture. So that issue sort of faded away. But I think seasonal migration is still really important more broadly in a couple of different ways. Again, trying to index what the distribution of fish actually is over 12 months relative to our three month uh, survey period. And the archival tag data give us an ability to define seasonality and habitat use from the perspective of individual fish. In the depth data in particular, we can see this movement offshore in the fall and this return to feeding in the, in the spring. We can aggregate that at the population level to, to define things like when fish are on the continental shelf and when they're on the slope, which can also relate to alongshore movement, define residency periods, um, and look at that in, in regional manners. This, these are data from the Bering Sea demonstrating that fish in sort of different eco-regions of the Bering Sea have very different or substantially different migration periods and migration dynamics than one another. So the movement of fish will be different if you're sitting in the CDQ community than if you're fishing out on the shelf edge you know, or if you're out in the Aleutian Islands. And all of this may be driven to at least some extent by water temperature and various other parameters that are subject to climate change. So all of this can be relevant in the climate change context of how the population structure may change over time. We can also analyze those migration periods specifically defining how many fish are on the move and therefore potentially subject to things like interception at any given period of time. And those provide parameters again for various movement states in migration models and Markov models. And finally, define active spawning periods. We've identified Andy sites in particular and identified these spawning rises that occur in the depth data highly subdiurnal in the course of minutes to hours, uh, common for almost all flat fishes that have been studied. They come off bottom to release eggs. It's just in halibut, they come 200 meters off bottom to release eggs instead of two meters off bottom. So this is an excellent way to define the active spawning period, egg release, as well as, again, looking at things like the difference between total mature 
spawning biomass and effective spawning biomass. And when you're running larval advection models and connectivity analyses, you need to know sort of when and what the distribution of actual egg release is. And so this gives you parameter inputs for things like larval advection models. And again, they demonstrated in starry flounder pretty clearly that spawn timing varies according to latitude and probably will also vary according to to climate forcing. In this case, your Oregon fish are spawning a lot earlier in the season than your fish are further north. That's probably uh, related to plankton blooms being later in the north because water has to warm up, the ice has to melt, and, and we may have similar dynamics for, for halibut where things change latitudinally and climate-wise. And again, we can develop sort of integrated metrics of all these things that can be loaded into models and, and various sort of harvest and policy analyses. Uh, summer home range analysis. This again harkens back to Julie Nielsen. This was a lot of the first half of her dissertation where she took a whole bunch of uh, satellite tagging and acoustic tracking data in Glacier Bay and analyzed that in order to characterize fish as residential or dispersive to look at different behavioral contingents within a smaller area. So net squared displacement statistical techniques to look at home range analysis and again these are dispersal kernels. These are two-dimensional dispersal kernels for individual fish, your tight kernels for residential fish and your broader kernels for dispersive fish. And I was also able to link that to the archival data. In Glacier Bay in particular, there's this beautiful ability to look at the temperature records and in a sense also the depth records. Residential fish stay in very cold water because Glacier Bay is a cold system with ice. And if these fish go offshore to spawn, they have to hop over a sill and then they enter warm deeper offshore water. So even for fish for which you don't have information on whether or not they truly left based on endpoint data and even light data, that's a clear signal that these fish left. And she was able to find spawning rises in at least one of these fish when they went offshore. So that gave her the ability to then define migratory contingents within a population. This again harkens back to notions of effective spawning biomass versus mature biomass and what are known as partial migration strategies in fish that I will simply say we've also seen in the Salish Sea and we probably see throughout Area 2C if we look hard enough. And I will simply say that acoustic tagging is an excellent way to look at a number of these things. Array studies uh, give you a lot of information on diurnal, subdiurnal, and seasonal habitat use for things like our questions on how does uh, low dissolved oxygen affect survey indices and feeding. An array study would be great for questions like whether or not fish are truly moving across Aleutian passes and the rates at which they do so. Gating studies would be excellent, but you have to do some setup work to determine exactly what your listening distances are. And I will simply say that in the literature, you will see a lot of studies that talk about seasonal habitat use and temporal habitat use based on how many fish you hear in the summer, how many fish you hear in the winter or during other periods. This is a figure of tags on a cinder block that didn't go anywhere, but there were more of them in the summer than there were in the winter. So in all of your acoustic studies, the lesson is that when you hear a fish, it's there. When you don't hear a fish, you don't know where it is. It might not be there, and that you really have to understand the underlying physics of acoustic tag reception in your study area to know to what extent those patterns are fish behavior and which are hydrographic picnic line setting up, for instance. If you understand that, you can extract the pattern from the noise, you can normalize your fish data. But if you don't understand it, you're kind of at a loss. And the final two, diurnal and subdiurnal, we had an intern, John Scott, who was, well, not intern, he was our undergraduate scholarship awardee in 2012 and 2013. We took a bunch of our PAT tag data and did spectral analysis to look at patterns in depth changes. Uh, spectral analysis essentially developed during World War II to try to pull enemy radio transmissions out of the electronic noise. Turns out to be an excellent matter, uh, method for pulling any pattern out of noise. And in here, two different uh, methods, periodogram and wavelet analysis. In the periodograms, at 24 hours, you see these nice, clear signals of diurnal activity. And in the wavelet transforms, these nice, clear tidal patterns where the fish are moving up and down according to tide, and quiet periods in the middle. So these are important, again, for defining activity periods and hidden Markov models and knowing which dispersal kernel to apply to your movement. 
And also, uh, flatfish in particular are known to use a lot of tidal stream transport. So that could be periods when your fish speed, movement speeds change. And this can also relate again back to survey CPUE. I know Eric in the past did a bunch of analyses looking at survey CPUE related to tidal cycles. That would be observational. This could be the mechanism of fish feeding according to tide and changing CPUE without changing underlying abundance. And similarly, uh, Francisca Broyel, who at the time was at Dalhousie University, we collaborated with her on the development of high resolution accelerometry tags. And some of you are familiar with the accelerometry in the context of discard mortality studies, indexing life and death. She's more interested in these really high frequency, like one, once a second or less than once a second recording tags that give you things like tail beat frequency and fish size and speed and swimming activity versus non-swimming activity, which can link into bioenergetic studies. Again, they can link into your movement models, defining behavioral states. So we did a bunch of those calibrations in the lab at Oregon Coast Aquarium when we had fish down there. And then she and Julie Nielsen deployed tags in Port Frederick in the, south, in the Southeast Alaska to sort of uh, field vet those Bunch more wavelet transforms, again, active periods, quiescent periods, both diurnal, and I believe there were tidal in there as well. That's hourly, so that's the diurnal cycle. You may not have seen tidal. Again, in this case, paired with swimming speed and fish size, which is pretty cool, especially the fish size. You could actually watch these things grow based on tail beat frequency if you had enough data resolution. So overall, more understanding for modeling migration and understanding population structure and effects of behavior and structure on management relevant concerns. And hopefully I've given you an idea of how broad these studies are, how they scale from small to large and how integrated they are and how they all sort of feed off one another. And finally, because no man is an island, this really took a lot of people. Some, some of these people you've seen on the previous slides, but all of these people had something to do with the data outputs and or graphics that you have seen. And these are just the people outside of the building. The people inside the building clearly include Joan, Tracy, the survey group, Steve Kamer, Bill Clark, Steve Hare, Bruce Lehman, all of our vessel captains, our survey crews, our summer sea samplers, a lot of work goes into this and a lot of different agencies and a lot of different expertises that we can't possibly have. And I also could have worked up a big bibliography of two to three dozen papers that describe most of the results that are here, which I could still do if people want to, but I didn't bother because it wouldn't fit on one slide anyway. And that is where I will end. Well, thanks very much, Tim. That was, that was great. Questions from the audience? No, maybe I'll break the ice with one with the um, the possibility of sex-specific migrations. Yeah. yeah. Males and females yeah. moving at different rates yeah. at different times in their life history. That's a fascinating yeah. question. And, and it breaks down into its two general theories, both of which have been demonstrated in, in the wild, so it makes it kind of interesting. The first theory is that males should migrate and disperse much further than females and be much less site faithful because they don't have the energetic constraints that females do of producing eggs for bat spawning. So females tend to be more resident, they tend to be more site faithful, they tend to spawn where they are, they can't waste energy migrating all over the place. On the flip side, for a sexually dimorphic species, it has been demonstrated, for instance, in striped bass, that the bigger you are, the further you swim. And it's just size related. And so in halibut, females would swim a lot further than males because they're bigger, they have a bigger tail beat frequency, they can cruise faster, and they can get further than a male. And I don't know if my microphone has just disappeared. No, nope. it's back. So for halibut, we don't really have enough data to analyze that. In the future, with more sex, and more long-term dispersal, we hope to be able to drill in into that. Offhand, I would guess that halibut are more the former, that males are gonna be a lot more chaotic and a lot more dispersive than females. And in a halibut fishery where you're biased 80% female, understanding differential dispersal patterns between the fraction of the stock you're harvesting and the fraction of the stock that you're harvesting more lightly can also be important to policy and, and assessment. Sorry. 
So I know you've had this question a lot, but <laughs> it does come up. Um, so for the pat tags, yeah. uh, this was definitely pat tag, lots of pat tag information. Um, and also actually the archival tags. Yeah. Do you have any sense of how long it takes a fish to get sort of used to this, sort of used to having this thing trailing behind it or, or you know, um, or having the wounds heal from yeah. having been implanted or something like that? And I mean, you would expect that or I mean, I would think that it would probably affect the behavior up until they're sort of used to it and they can kind of go about their way. So is that accounted for in the amount of time that you have these things at large? And do you kind of cut off the ends to sort of, um, I mean, what? Do you, how do you yeah. deal with at, that? At this juncture, we don't account for it at all. That goes back to the famous commissioner quote of, if I had something the size of a hot dog hanging off me, the first thing I'd want to do is get rid of it. And that's completely valid. And so we have completely, I would say, biased information from watching fish heal in the tank after we tag them, that their behavior doesn't change much, but that's also a fish whose entire energetic demands are to swim 10 feet over to the free herring that we gave them. It's probably highly different in the wild. We don't account for that. And I would say that one of the nice things about the long-term archival tags is we may get a better resolution on that. You've got a fish that's been out for three, five, seven years, and you notice that they are consistently, despite their age, less dispersive and less active for X period of time after tagging, you can infer that that might be a recovery period. And I will say that in one of our experiments and in a number of the PAT tag data, what we see is fish becoming highly nocturnal after being tagged. And then some period of time later, they will go back to sort of a more day active pattern or a less strictly diurnal pattern. And we have questioned whether or not that's seasonal because we always tag these things in the summer. Are they highly diurnal in the summer and then become less diurnal in the fall when they start migrating? Or is that a tagging effect? Is it that the last time they came out during the day because our survey specs say you have to fish during the day, they got a giant dart stuck in them and got sucked out of the ground by aliens. And it takes them three or four months to recover from that stress. So the short answer is we don't know, and the long answer is we hope to be able to drill down into that with, with more data. Great talk. Uh, lots of information. Uh, it's really good for a new employee here. Um, I was curious, um, you mentioned briefly about like PDO and those yeah. um, long-term um, kind of oceanographic trends on the yeah. eastern, northeastern Pacific. I'm kind of curious if you know if there's any current trends for Pacific halibut as far as potentially losing their southern range or potentially being affected by broad scale, longer El Ninos, more, you know, hypoxic zones and yeah. them migrating away from those types of scenarios. Yeah. In the adult and even sort of the late juvenile data, the answer appears to be no from ev any, everything we can tell. There have been a number of analyses that have looked at halibut distribution and CPU related to water temperature. In the archival tag data, we see that they can pretty well tolerate voluntarily temperatures as low as negative one and as high as 14, which encompasses the entire range. And so it's really frustrating to have all of these temperature data for the adults and, and late juveniles and not be able to see anything in it. But I would suspect that there could be very strong effects on early life history phases. And that's a lot of what uh, the larval evection modeling that Esther and Lori and Ray and, and Janet are doing, uh, affecting both infection patterns and those tend to be the more sensitive life history stages to things like temperature and acidification. And that then would link back into trying to figure out spatial recruitment dynamics. What you might start to see is a loss of input from Southern nurseries if you could figure out what fish are from Southern nurseries. So it's still highly relevant. These data that I've shown you don't really speak to that very much. Do we have any questions from the webinar attendees, no? There wasn't a second ago, but there is now. Um, Jane Sullivan asks, um, if you have any updated information related to size-dependent migration, 
connected to a parent's spatial patterns in size at age? Uh, is that the whole question? Yeah. I would throw that directly to Ray because the, from the pit tagging data, he probably has better resolution than anything else we could possibly have. So. <laughs> so she asks and from the survey data, if right. there's any updated information related to size dependent migration that's connected to the apparent spatial patterns in size at age. And, and Ian and Alan might also have insight on that, but they're unfortunately neither neither of them's available today. They're at various meetings. So, so sorry, Jane, the answer there is nobody here can answer your question. But if you keep bugging us by by email and personally, we, we might actually have an answer hidden somewhere that's not in this room. If there are no more questions from the uh, webinar, uh, any more questions from the audience here? No? Well, thanks very much, Alrighty. Tim. That was